The first question is about the Googleization of, of health. Yeah. Um, what is, can you tell us about your recent project yeah. and how can citizens be empowered when it comes to data ownership? Mm, okay, so those are two, two things in there. I'll start with the first. Um, so this notion of the Googleization of health, of health research is mostly what I'm working on. It's something I've been interested in the past year or so. So I'm coming from uh, ethics and healthcare and uh, kind of the societal implications of new technologies in healthcare. Uh, and I recently became aware of this uh, phenomenon, which is just that in the past two years or so, uh, every one of the major consumer tech companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook even, uh, Apple, etc., has entered into the field of health and health research in, in, in quite a significant way. And this is because um, health and biomedicine, like many other fields, have been uh, datified in a sense. So biomedicine is increasingly becoming a data-intensive science. And this data that's very important to use in biomedicine and how it's at least being envisioned in the future is in many cases being created or generated outside of the traditional spaces of medical research, so outside of laboratories and hospitals. Many times uh, just by individuals as they go about their daily lives interacting with consumer devices like mobile apps and sensors or social media. So this is kind of, um, we have this kind of expansion of the health research ecosystem to include this new type of data and that also makes a space for new actors. So these uh, companies who are kind of experts in data, in generating data or manufacturing the devices that generate data and collecting data and storing it and analyzing, this has allowed them actually to become these kind of new important players in the field of health research. So we're seeing more and more that these companies are starting to uh, facilitate health research and in some cases even initiate health research themselves. So there's stuff like um, last year Apple launched the Research Kit platform. So this is a platform that allows researchers who partner with Apple to develop an app on which they can run a, a clinical study, a medical study. So basically the idea is you can use the iPhone to run a clinical study. So there are like 20 or so of these studies now, and this is in collaboration with some of the leading research institutes in the world, well, mostly in the US for the moment. It's just, just starting in Europe now, in the Netherlands, two, two studies. But so places like Yale, Stanford, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, really top-notch institutions are getting quite excited about this, of developing these apps as clinical studies. Um, so that's Apple, that's one of the important kind of initiatives in this, in this domain. Google, well, Google is, is it's moving into the life sciences in all kinds of ways. So maybe just to point out some of the interesting ones, they have a study that they launched in 2014 called the Google Baseline Study. This is in collaboration with Duke uh, and Stanford universities. And the idea there is to collect, well, to recruit, first of all, 10,000 volunteers, but this would be healthy people, and to track uh, clinical, genetic, uh, molecular, but also lifestyle data on these people um, and kind of watch, that would be this baseline data that would allow kind of a painting of an ideal picture of health and then kind of wait until these people transition into ill health to see what's happening so that ultimately the goal there is to develop uh, preventive treatments. Um, Google's also doing things like it has this Google genomic service which is supposed to be a kind of cloud repository upon which researchers can move genomic knowledge uh, and run analyses on it. So they have this Google query uh, service. So all kinds of things. The, 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 uh, just yeah, Google is doing it in very interesting ways. Um, we've got companies like 23andMe, which is a bit older, but it's uh, backed by Google money and Facebook money. And this is a private genetic testing uh, company. Uh, that originally, you know, their business model was kind of to sell these genetic kits over the internet and give people some uh, findings about their uh, disease risk and ancestry, though they had problems with the FDA around that. But they're also doing research using this data. So <coughs> people who do these tests, they can kind of donate back their genetic data alongside phenotypic data that they fill doing uh, surveys. And 23andMe is doing research using this. So they've got quite a few publications. They're partnering with some biopharmaceutical companies now um, to do this. 
Now, this is all, it's quite exciting for life scientists because there's all kinds of, of benefits in doing this type of uh, mobile uh, enabled uh, uh, research. So, uh, you know, if you're using an iPhone to do uh, a study, you can reach millions of iPhone users. Uh, you can recruit them quickly. Um, this is something that traditionally clinical studies have a hard time doing, getting to all these people. It's also good data. It's very sensitive data, it's heterogeneous data, and it's kind of being constantly collected. So there's lots of pluses to this. There's a lot of downsides, of course. I don't have to tell people who are at this event, and that's what I've been looking at uh, recently. Um, so maybe just to go through them quickly, some of the, some of the uh, risks involved here. Well, I've thought of these in terms of three types of risks. There's uh, risks that are mostly scientific in a sense of like how good the science will be that emerges from this, how uh, scientifically rigorous is the data, but that's kind of a, a question that's internal to science. Um, there's a scientific question that, that's actually a question of social justice and that's what's new, what new biases are being introduced into this type of research. So if you're doing research uh, on a population of iPhone users, it's wonderful because you could reach millions of people, but they're a specific type of people. So iPhone users tend to be richer, whiter, uh, better educated and healthier actually than the general population. So, you know, how representative is this type of research of populations? Same thing using social media for research. But then we have issues uh, which are more related to kind of bioethics and research ethics. Privacy, of course, is a, is a very important concern here. Um, informed consent is another one. Are we kind of, what should we do as, yeah. as citizens, no? Yeah. What is our power? What yeah. Yeah, well, I, of course, I don't have one answer to this. It's and it's a, it's a complex issue because I think that it depends how this kind of research will be done. So informed consent can be done in better and less good ways. Um, for most of this research, at least the research kit, people need to give informed consent to participate. So that's already one barrier that perhaps is not the same exact thing as data extractivism that we see from data exhaust, right? And uh, what these companies are doing, and doing very well and efficiently, and that's also one of uh, the concerns here, is that they appeal to doing good. They appeal to research and public interest. So there's a lot of empirical research on um, the fact that people are usually willing to share personal health data if it's, if it's done for research. People are happy to do that. Uh, and these companies are kind of mobilizing a lot of that rhetoric there. So that's a danger. I don't know if data ownership is the way to go. So data ownership, there's some issues um, that we tend to think that ownership of data means we have complete control over data and that's not necessarily the case in legal terms and also in practical ones. So you know there's a difference between having ownership over your body or having ownership over information about your body which we're also getting from each other as we pass each other in the street. Um, so some people are talking about uh, what we need to do is privatize the data entirely. So if companies can do this kind of privatization, we need to do it as well. If they can monetize, so should we. Um, I think that's a protectionist attitude. There's a problem there that we start in this game of, you know, who, who, who's the real owner of the data? And that moves us away from things like how do we use this data in ways that are useful for the common good. So in medicine, you have this notion of informed consent. Uh, the issue with informed consent with privacy as well is that what it tends to do is protect individuals. So there's a lot of push to say make more fine-grained consent, that we'll have more say before we consent to do something. But informed consent does one thing. It allows people to agree to participate in research, and then it kind of cuts off their voice. They don't have a say in what happens afterwards. So I don't think more informed consent, more of this kind of data ownership is the way to go because what it does is it fragments collectives, actually, it turns us all into individuals, it doesn't allow us to have a say in this together. So one other way of thinking about this, uh, and there are some interesting initiatives around this, is to take a kind of commons-based approach to say, you know, this data shouldn't be seen as a private good nor even as a public good that's regulated by the public domain because there are issues there as well, it should be seen as a common good. Uh, and then what do we do there to govern this coll collectively and make decisions about this collectively? Uh, and what, has to, what should be changing there, I think, and a lot of people are thinking about this, ethicists for example, about new forms of consent. So to move away from this model of um, 
specific consent to one project to a, a model of non-specific consent where you agree to donate or to participate in research by giving this data or sharing this data for a research project and similar ones but this has to be coupled with a, gov with a model of, of, of governance of data sets whereby the people who are giving away this data know or they have representatives who can have a say in what's being done with it further on and when people can opt out and harm mitigation strategies that happen in case something goes wrong. So it's kind of a whole thinking about governance that needs to be redone. I mean, it's not just about privacy or even just informed consent. Even if we get those things right, we'll have other issues. There are many other issues at stake here that I think have to do with this idea of the common good and where is the public interest in all of this. Um, so that's one of the biggest risks, I think, in a lot of this Googleization of health research is these kind of new power asymmetries that are emerging in this field. So these are collaborative things for the moment, but it's not clear what type of collaborations they are. Are these companies going to be displacing traditional public research institutions? Not to say that public research institutions were wonderful, uh, uh, always uh, there for public interest. There are issues there. So this whole public-private thing might need to be rethought as well. But what is going to be their role? You know, we're always talking about um, or there's this push from the European Union for, and, and universities as well to open science. But these companies are compiling very big data sets with uh, data that's going to be uh, uh, a gold mine for the future of biomedicine. But these will be either proprietary data sets or these companies will be gatekeepers of these data sets. This really contrasts with an idea of open science. Uh, and, and, you know, scientists being able to tap into this wonderful, rich well of uh, personal health data. So there are lots of issues of that around about, uh, th these are questions of power and control, really, not just of bioethics and privacy. How do you see the connection between the rise of these Silicon Valley companies uh, and as a players in, in this health field and, and the problems that austerity and privatization mm -hmm. uh, are affecting the, the, the welfare state mm -hmm. as a whole. Mm -hmm. So you kind of... Yeah, I've touched on it yes. slightly, but um, well, I think simply put, this couldn't happen. I mean, this could only happen the way it's happening on the backdrop of a kind of collapse of, of, of the welfare state as, as we've known it. Um, so it's kind of in somewhat of a vacuum that these companies can step into, like health research and healthcare, uh, and once they do, that reinforces the cycle, right, because then governments are saying, well, they're taking care of it so we can step out even further. Uh, I think more specifically in this, in kind of biomedicine and biomedical research, there's two trends here that are kind of interesting. So there's also this idea in, in health in general, we have this increased emphasis on individual responsibility. So we're seeing this shift. Uh, when we talk about things like personalized medicine and personalized healthcare or precision medicine, which is a term that's used in the U.S. more, part of that is an emphasis on this idea that people, individual citizens and patients, need to become more uh, involved in their health. They need to become more aware of their health risks. They need to be more proactive in terms of uh, managing their chronic conditions and their lifestyle habits. Uh, and if they don't, if they continue to smoke or they continue to uh, uh, not pay attention to their risk of diabetes by losing weight, then they can be stigmatized and penalized either by not allowing them to access certain treatments um, you know, or health insurance premiums, which can be on the rise, personalized health insurance. So this emphasis on individual responsibility is something we're seeing in all these domains. Um, that bioethicist Donna Dickinson has called this very nicely, the move from we medicine to me medicine. So this idea that there was a collective kind of responsibility for welfare, for health, education, and other types. And this is shifting from uh, governments, from the collective, onto the shoulders of individual citizens. And that's very problematic. It's problematic for health outcomes because there's not any real evidence base that this makes people healthier, um, and for all kinds of reasons, of course. Uh, and what's interesting there, I think, is that there's a certain appeal to solidarity in this discourse. So it's interesting that there is an appeal here to solidarity, right, because the discourse is kind of saying, well, if everybody's a little bit more responsible for themselves, we'll all be better off. 
uh, will all be healthier as a population and will be financially healthier. This is a serious strategy in cost reduction, right? If people take care of themselves, then the government has to pay less for that. Uh, so it's an appeal to solidarity, but it's a very different type of solidarity than we're used to, at least in Europe, uh, and thinking of welfare states, right? Solidarity doesn't have that individualizing moment there that, that builds up in that way. Um, so there's that on the one hand, this kind of increased emphasis on individual responsibility. The other thing is that, um, well, these companies, what they're doing also, and Evgeny just mentioned this earlier, he explained it quite very nicely, that these companies, what they do is they kind of come uh, to states and say, well, you've got, you know, you, you've got this public health care crisis, you've got austerity, you've got inefficiency in your systems. What we do is make these systems efficient. We're experts in this kind of data management. So give us your data. This is what Google DeepMind has done with the NHS. Give us access to your data um, and we'll kind of make it efficient for you and help you uh, reduce your costs. Um, the companies during this time are using this data to develop uh, other, serv other types of things like their, you know, deep mind machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence. They need this data, it feeds on that. Uh, but, but governments seem to be quite happy to let this happen and to come in and to partner up with these. I mean, the Google deep mind controversy was unbelievable what's happening, what's ha still happening now. Uh, that the NHS allowed Google deep mind to access this over 1.5 million people's personal health data, you know, and kind of use it to, to develop this app, which won't benefit most of those people in any way. Um, so again, like in the Google DeepMind issue, the biggest, um, uh, the biggest thing we were hearing about in this controversy was informed consent. Have these people consented to allow Google DeepMind to access all of this data? Uh, the simple uh, answer is no. The more complicated one is, is yes. But um, the main issue here is do we want you know, a company like Google to have access to all of this data when it's already so, popu uh, so, so popular, so powerful, and what it can do with these vast data sets. And again, if they start becoming uh, these gatekeepers of this data that will be necessary for biomedicine in the, in the future, what kind of price are we going to pay to get access to that data that we kind of gave away for free? What do you think about technological sovereignty? You know? uh, I mean, and how can we work, uh, or, or how are you, you know, working or, or, or yes, or evaluating or, or analyzing it to struggle it? You know? What is yeah. your maybe your research yeah. uh, paper and, and your work around yeah. this? Yeah. Well, I'm a little bit new to this, so I'm not actually an activist myself, and then I feel quite guilty, <laughs> but. Um, of course, I think technological sovereignty is something to struggle for in light of everything I've said uh, and in light of this kind of increased monopolization of digital infrastructures by this handful of very powerful companies, especially when these dig digital infrastructures are becoming uh, necessary for our everyday life, uh, if it's healthcare or just you know, staying in touch with people. Um, the, the little bit of work I've done on, on trying to look at initiatives that would try to resist this uh, are in, in this uh, health domain, and that, that's this idea of trying to think of personal health data as a commons. So what kind of, um, what kind of commons-based governance models could be uh, built up around this? So I'm starting to do a little bit of empirical work on these to go see what they're doing exactly. So I've only read about them so far, but there's one initiative in Switzerland called the My Data Health Bank Co-op. I'm not sure exactly how they call themselves. But the idea there and what we're seeing in these other initiatives is that somehow people can decide to uh, share personal health data with some kind of platform, which would be a nonprofit organization's platform. Uh, they own this key to kind of encrypted data. And these platforms uh, allow researchers to access this data. But the people who have uh, donated or shared the data have a say in every step of the way, what kind of research or what sub data set can be accessed. So this My Data Cooperative in, this, in Switzerland is running two uh, research um, projects with two hospitals in uh, Switzerland. Um, there's Open Humans, which is an interesting initiative. This is in the United States, and it's a bit of a similar uh, idea. So it's also a platform onto which people can upload all kinds of data that they generate on their different devices or sensors or 23andMe, for example. 
and researchers can approach them and say, hey, we're doing, we're, we want to run this project, do you want to participate in this? So you get these platforms which are becoming interesting mediators in this uh, expansion kind of of this health research ecosystem. They're going to become new stakeholders at some point, which requires some critical analysis as well. Uh, but for the moment, I think they're very interesting initiatives. Sage Bionetworks is another one, and Sage Bionetworks is one of the biggest ones. They've worked with Apple in the first five research kit studies. So they also act as this kind of data <coughs> repository and management system where the uh, data goes from the iPhone to there, and they allow what they call qualified researchers, so you can't be just anybody to access this data. You have to sign a certain ethical uh, kind of uh, uh, guideline form and things like that. Um, so it's interesting, and these, these are all not-for-profit companies. So I think that's one way to start thinking about this, but we have to follow this to see how it's going. <coughs> There's downsides to that, of course, too. This, this type of thing requires a lot of involvement on the part of people. You know, and it's one thing to say activists are very willing to do this kind of work and to be very informed about it, but I don't think just anyone wants to be so involved in every step of the way of what's happening with their personal data, and I don't think we should expect that of citizens either. So do we start putting in place some um, form of representation of citizens who we would trust to make those decisions on our behalf? That, that's something that has to be looked at as well.